So let's talk about iCarly now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually, did you ever watch iCarly? I, I caught it every now and then, but I don't think I ever sat down to watch an entire episode. I didn't care. I think I was beyond the age. As we know, though, I have a sister that's 10 years younger than me. So That is weird, because I keep forgetting how much younger yeah. she is than you. So I saw a lot of iCarly, and I actually started listening to the girl who, the blonde one, uh, the girl who played Sam, has a podcast. Oh, my God. Oh, and I forget what it's called. It's um, It's something, like, dark. Yes. Oh, it's called Empty Inside. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I just looked it up. She interviews a bunch of people, and she talks about, like, what a miserable experience being a child actor is. Oh, this. nice! Yeah, it's it's actually a really interesting uh, podcast. Especially, you know, like, I didn't have any great attachment uh, to her being on iCarly or anything like that. So, a lot of people, I, I guess, were like, she's not in the new show, obviously, because she hated the experience hates it yeah <laughs> I, I don't know if she hates the people but she just she didn't want to do it her mom made her do it general topic areas are comedy eating disorders filmmaking jealousy therapy and the crippling sense of doom we all face as we desperately try to fill the void within i like her nice. podcast i guess that's a little <laughs> plug that she does she definitely doesn't need from us yeah you're getting the words about books boost <laughs> Yeah, you're getting the words about books bump. You're going to have three new listeners. <laughs> Gibson? William Gibson? Is, you, is that right? You have like a condition with names. It's William Gibson. Oh, yeah. I Congratulations. I'm you remembered right. the name of an author. Oh, man. Are you I sure feel... it wasn't Count Zero by Brandon Sanderson? Are you sure? Or Brian uh, Sanderson, as Brian you call Sanderson. him. Brian yeah. Sanderson. <laughs> oh, Jesus, dude. It's funny, because I looked at the Wheel of Time, and I was like, oh, Brian Sanderson does that. Oh, yeah, it's Brandon Sanderson. Okay, no, Robert Jordan does that. He wrote the last three books. This is Words About Books. I'm Ben, he's Nate, and we're talking about Count Zero by William Gibson. Uh, Nate, you read it more recently than I do. How are we doing this? Uh... Kind of, I guess, how we did Neuromancer. Uh, we're not going to okay. go real in depth with the plot. Is that what you want to do? Yeah, I think so. I think it's this. It's similar to Neuromancer in that it's very similar to Neuromancer. But spoiler alert: I didn't like it nearly as much as Neuromancer. It's... It wasn't bad, but it it was like it was it was like more of the same, but like it's not fresh as Neuromancer was. It's got the the sequel problem. Yes. Where Neuro, Neuromancer kind of captured lightning in a bottle with the whole cyberpunk thing. It was new, it was fresh, and it was touching on a lot of a lot of really relevant things at the time. I, I don't I didn't read Count Zero until last till this year actually. So, obviously I didn't read it when it was coming out. The future of the internet played out a little differently than than William Gibson was envisioning for better or for worse. Neuromancer was kind of a noir heist story set in that cyberpunky world right and count zero is like a three-part character study yeah that that <laughs> kind of is themed around the interweaving lives of three very different people and it doesn't come together until the end and one of the story threads doesn't really come together with the other two at all very very loosely i guess i should say yeah kind of i i well one, I I one of my problems is the three threads are not all as interesting as one another so i agree with that every time it went to one of the threads i was like oh oh great another chapter i don't really care too much about I'm like let's get back to the stuff i enjoy Maybe one of the reasons, now that I'm thinking about it, that I did enjoy Neuromancer more, not just the fact that it was the first and that it was hyped up to me, but Shadowrun, both the video games <laughs> and the tabletop games, as well as Cyberpunk 2077, they both have that cyberpunk heist thing going on, so it's a lot more similar to what I've already experienced in the cyberpunk genre, uh, Neuromancer is, 
whereas this is not that. <laughs> That's an interesting thought. I didn't feel it wasn't cyberpunky enough. I thought no. it had about the same atmosphere as Neuromancer. It was the heist element that was missing. Oh, I see. It I was see. the, we got to do these things to set up a job to do this thing. And along the way, they learned something about themselves. <laughs> It was a risk, I think, to tell the story the way he told it, because there really isn't a primary plot. That's no. kind of what it's lacking. If you asked me to sit you down and give you the pitch like of Neuromancer, I could say, you know, back of the book, it's about a hacker who gets involved in this complicated heist. Turns out the heist is organized not by a person, but by an artificial intelligence. And the purpose of the heist is to break the artificial intelligence out of its confines and allow it to evolve into a super intelligence. And if you ask me for the same sort of pitch for Count Zero, it's about three people whose lives are intertwined by a connection to artificial intelligences and a new technology of biochip yeah and, and the biochip and then um what happens actually isn't as clear <laughs> so i right. you know, i think sort of the end is up to interpretation in a lot of ways now i, I guess in mona lisa overdrive they might clarify some of that but as a standalone book which it seems to want to be. It doesn't seem to want to be a sequel because it's it's more just another novel set in the Neuromancer world. You didn't need to read Neuromancer to get this. It helps. There are a lot yeah, of references they, back to Neuromancer. They briefly kind of mention the plot of Neuromancer, but it's a blink and you miss it thing as far as i can tell i don't know how this has been branded now but i don't know if it when it came out this was like advertised as part two of the sprawl chronicles or whatever like every book is today <laughs> i don't know when it became the sprawl trilogy like you know how it, it almost reminds me of the um the simon Pegg and and nick frost movies the oh the, yeah the Cord the Cornetto Neto. trilogies? Or yeah, where or they have Cornetto, nothing to do forget, with each other. But... It's just the same director and the same actors. Yeah, it's just the same vibe. <laughs> yeah, because one uh... of them has zombies, one of them is a cop movie, and one of them has aliens. Yeah. And they have some nods to each other that make it a little more enjoyable, but you don't have to know anything about Shaun of the Dead to enjoy Hot Fuzz. Right, well, they're all connected by that... Uh... The reason I'm forgetting the name is it's some British brand of ice cream. Yeah, the rapper just kind of shows up. Yeah, that's the link. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a great debate over like other movies with it. Like was was the uh, the Paul movie with Seth Rogen was that part of it? And it's like no, there's no rapper. There's in it. Uh, that guy did the Scott Pilgrim guy didn't direct it. And Paul movie with. Yeah, there's a, where um, Seth Rogen voices a CGI gray alien. Oh, I never saw that one. But no, it's not part of it. Shut up. Not that it matters. <laughs> I mean, not, they're not. Yeah, they're not linked. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they're not linked very. They're very uh, very well. And I think that's kind of the Cornetto point. multiverse. The Cornetto multiverse. Maybe they need to have a. Uh, Cornetto streaming service. Let's go on. Neuromancer books. I'm a bookman. You're, bu you're bookman. I'm bookman. Okay, I guess we could just start with the title, Ben. Uh, Count Zero refers to <laughs> one of our three characters, and I don't feel like he's the most important of the three plot lines. What do you think about that, Ben? Did you just say, what do you think? <laughs> what are you think? <laughs> I'm a bookman. <laughs> I English good. We've got Turner who is a corporate mercenary type. Yes. We've got Bobby, a.k.a. Count Zero, who is what they call a hot dogger, shitty net runner. He's like Case if Case were bad at everything. And you've got, you've got Marley, who is a former art gallery owner in Paris, who is assigned by a super rich guy to find the painter who painted some cubes and it's a sculpture <laughs> it's definitely a sculpture oh my bad is it <laughs> yes 
<laughs> it's like a miniature thing. It's not a painting. Okay. The artist makes these boxes and arranged in the boxes are just sort of like random items. But the catch is they're the boxes are designed in a way that when you look at them, you feel something very deep, but nobody can explain why or what they feel. And of course, you're reading a book about it. And so that's his his way of like, imagine such a thing existed. I can't tell you how it makes you feel because no one can describe how it makes them feel. So it's like H.P. Lovecraft, but he doesn't try to actually explain the weird feelings. He doesn't go, man, is, isn't this weird? <laughs> isn't this sculpture weird, yeah. guys? I hate comparing books to movies, but it's it kind of reminds me of the uh, the briefcase in Pulp Fiction, how it's just a golden light. Nobody ever knows what's inside it, but everybody needs that briefcase. Right. All, all the people open it up and go, holy shit. That's how I imagine these these art pieces. People look at them and they're just like, my God, truly they were as gods that built this. And <laughs> speaking of gods, though, they were. There's only a handful of characters that come back from Neuromancer, but what we'll learn as the book goes on is that in Neuromancer, Neuromancer and Wintermute fused into the AI the true super intelligence they were always meant to be. And by the time of Count Zero, it seems like they have fractured... I thought it was they they had leftovers that didn't quite fuse as well. I think your opinion is as valid as mine on this. I really <laughs> don't know. So I got the impression, and I think we're just going to be all over the place with this one. This is Yeah, cuz we never did answer my question of why is it named after Bobby? Well, what what are you going to call it? Turner? <laughs> I was trying to see if there was a hooch in this. Maybe you could have called it Turner, Turner. and Hooch. <laughs> the Turner Diaries. Turner and Man Hooch. Turner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I mean, the, the words about books, deep cuts. I love them. That's, that's one for the super fans. We need to, we need to look into selling Man Hooch t-shirts, though. <laughs> it's just like a bottle of moonshine called Man Hooch. It's what men drink. <laughs> <laughs> now let's let's talk for a minute about the um the loa and the ais because this is why i said like i don't know what actually happened in the book <laughs> i'm glad it wasn't only me <laughs> well i don't think you're necessarily supposed to know i'll say that in in gibson's defense i think he's dealing with some pretty high-minded philosophical concepts about consciousness and and the nature of intelligence and so i think there are multiple interpretations of what's going on and i think like the art piece you're not really supposed to be able to describe it in words it's just kind of a thing you have to experience and marley winds up having that awakening i think marley and the girl turner saves are possibly the only ones who I think actually understand what go, what's going on. And maybe that's why it's called count zero and based on Bobby, because the reader has a lot more in common with Bobby <laughs> than with any of the like, people who actually know what's going on. Yeah. Bobby, uh, Bobby is, Bobby's a simple man. He knows about net runners and like what they do, but doesn't know how they do it. And he, we're introduced to him trying his first ever net run and he almost dies during it. He almost gets fried by some anti-hacker software. Have I ever talked to you? I, f I have the distinct memory of saying this into a microphone. Have I ever talked to you about the concept of a script kitty? Yes, we did talk about this, I think, during The Fold. So okay. you might want to repeat yeah. it again because no one listened to that episode. Because it was like three hours long each. So a script kitty. I don't know how often this term is used anymore. The, the nature of of the biz has changed quite a bit. But back in my day, a script kitty was somebody who wanted to be a hacker, but didn't want to do the hard work of actually understanding systems or code or how hacking actually happened. So they would instead just download or buy programs written by other hackers, scripts, and they would just use those to to conduct their hacks so they could get like a, a password cracker tool or something instead of writing their own. Like they were the type of person who just didn't know how to begin to write a password cracker, but they called themselves hackers. And so other hackers took offense to that. 
<laughs> and referred to them as script kitties to insinuate that they were not real hackers. Yeah, see also Visual Basic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> random shot at Visual Basic. My first job, certain, well, my first proper job was uh, Visual Basic coding, believe really? it or not. I thought that that was just like yep. a gateway into actual coding. No, I worked on a government project written in VB.net. Oh my god. Yeah, I took a I took a course in programming in high school and I couldn't take any more cuz I then went to virtual school and all we did was learn visual basic for that first semester. No, I did a, a VB.net uh I want to say the whole back end was uh visual basic. It was a bear to maintain and like it was I remember when we had to upgrade it to like the newer version of visual basic it was that old it was it was like a at the time i was working on it it was a 10 year old piece of software <laughs> oh the government they they find a thing that works and they just never let it go <laughs> they're still using a version of dos <laughs> yeah oh yeah like a lot of the uh yeah I the had military a... stuff when they it takes them forever to approve new tech unless you're on the bleeding edge i had to input my time oh god don't even and and do you know how many timesheets i fill out every week well i was like okay how do i enter this because i tried enter tried space no no way to do it and the douchebag was like oh you don't know how to do that yeah you just hit number lock I'm like oh yeah why didn't i think of number lock oh that's right because i only ever used to turn my keypad on you jackass he was acting smug about it, like, God, everyone should know that you use number lock. You never use number lock for anything else. Anyway, we're getting off the topic of Count Zero and Bobby being a script kitty hot dogger piece of shit who almost <laughs> dies trying to hack into <laughs> into a place. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, is that the term for script kitty in the, uh, or or just, I guess, idiot in general in, in the hacker world of Neuromancer sprawl universe is hot dogger which I love. It's a great word for it. So Bobby bought software off a guy that was supposed to break the ice, which is the security protocols. And then the guy also gave him a target to run the software on for his first run. It was supposed to be a nice, easy target. He'd just hack in and and grab some data and get out. It's like a military database or something. <laughs> yeah, when he starts hacking this this ice, the ice is so strong that it locks Bobby's connection and starts like feeding back into his headset and frying Bobby's brain. And he is saved by some mysterious cyber angel who just comes down and's like, "Why are they doing that to you? Snip, be free, little bird." <laughs> Yes. Fly away. And yeah, Bobby just has the distinct impression that it was um, a girl who saved him. He, d he can't really explain why. He just It just felt female. The guy who sold it to him was testing the software to see if it actually worked. And he wasn't going to test it himself. So he just gave it to Bobby to test. And if Bobby died, he'd know it was not good. <laughs> yes. I don't think he thought Bobby would die, though. I think he thought Bobby would just get caught or something. But he didn't really care if Yeah, Bobby he didn't died. care either way. I think it went down like his his bosses were given the tech and they gave it to that guy and that guy was like, Yeah, okay, I'll just find an idiot to pawn this off on and he'll test it for me. Yeah. And so Bobby realizes like he broke into this stuff, he survived by the skin of his teeth, and somebody's gonna be coming for him now, because like he broke a lot of laws and uh, they obviously got his location, so he's got to get out of there. So he gets out of there, gets across town, just in time to see like a cruise missile blow up his apartment complex. And that's how Bobby knows he's in some deep shit. <laughs> I actually like where Bobby's story goes. Did you, which was your favorite storyline? I, hmm, definitely not Marley's. That was my least favorite. Because I didn't feel like very I much agree. happened. And yet, it was still vital. I think I like Marley more than you do, but I agree she she was not my favorite. I liked Turner's beginning story the most, where they're planning this job, and then, like, shit goes south really quick. There's a railgun that <laughs> that shoots at where their, their plane just was, 
and the target that they're trying to smuggle out of this corporation sends his daughter instead and then kills himself. And you're like, oh shit, he's on the run, don't know who to trust, don't know where to go. But then I think I, think I like Bobby's ending more. If you could somehow take the beginning of Turner's story and stitch it onto the end of Bobby's story, that'd be great. I like Bobby's story the most, but not because of Bobby. That's fair. Bobby winds up with this gang. He's the only white guy who's anywhere near them. They they originally gave him the bio software to check out. Bobby's story involves a lot of gang activity. So he's kind of on good terms with a lot of the gangs. There's kind of this like the goths versus what was the other one? There were the goths and something else. Those were gangs? And, and it was kind of like in a, yeah, they were gangs. Yeah. Huh goths and like normies or something yeah i forget they they were two gangs and they were kind of like oh like the warriors style gangs where they all had some weird costume (laughs) then there was this other gang that i don't think had a name it was just black people who had sort of a voodoo theme yeah they well i'll get to that but they had sort of built their own self-sustaining block like the building's are mini ecosystems almost yeah and so like this building has like water filtration uh hydroponic gardens and it's it's almost like its own little little spaceship out in the the wastelands of ohio and they take bobby in mostly because they want to know what the hell happened and there's two guys there's beauvoir and lucas yeah and they are my favorite characters in the book. And they start talking to Bobby about Loa and all these like voodoo gods. And it's unclear to me if they think they're actually gods or if they know what they are. But we find out that some of the AIs have taken on the persona of these Loa and they're acting basically according to the loa myths and they are able to help people out and do great things in cyberspace but they can also take control of certain human bodies temporarily to act in real space and can they take over other people's bodies well it seems like it's specific people yeah i thought it was only the girl no it's not only the girl because the one girl from the gang is a horse that's what they call the people they can ride she's a horse for one of the loa and i think the loa can take over her body as well jackie jackie yes okay i don't recall them ever taking over her body but i do think that they talked about it they they call her a horse and they say that the loa rides her maybe maybe they were just being lewd and crude and mean for no reason. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it meant that the Loa could act through her. Maybe not in the same capacity they can act through... Angie? The girl that Turner rescues in plot one has a bunch of cyber shit in her head that was put there by her father. Like, crazy biological stuff. She can get into the Matrix without a jack. And they... Yeah can speak yeah. through her, basically, in meat space. And it's not cybernetics. She doesn't have machines in her head. She has biological structures in her head that interface with the Matrix. Yeah, that's how the stories are all intertwined. They're all about this new biosoft. It's like the next big thing. They say it's going to replace silicone. It's some biologically yes. constructed stuff that we find out, I think, is... It's designed by the AIs and given to people. Yeah, yeah. There's, only, there's only one company that can make Biosoft. And at that company, it's kind of a trade secret. There's only one guy who knows how to make it work. And that is Angie's quote unquote father. I think he is her father, but you know, like he was told to father her. Yeah, he didn't seem to really care about her we find out later that the ai made a deal with angie's father they would basically take this guy and make him a legend in his field he was he was not destined for greatness he was struggling in school and then this ai finds him and says i will give you 
these groundbreaking discoveries and then you will take credit for them and it'll be great and in exchange you will make me this being (laughs) right and that is that is angie it's kind of presented as this interesting dichotomy the ais want to basically jack into our world through the medium of a human of a human brain and we want to jack into the matrix through the medium of the decks and things like that we each kind of want each other's world (laughs) and so the ais propose an exchange this is where we were getting a little confused towards the beginning of the podcast i thought that the loa were fractured elements of the neuromancer winter mute yeah intelligence and i thought that they were things that just didn't merge like the two merged into a super intelligence and then they these other ais are like the leftovers that didn't get incorporated into the super intelligence for whatever reason so then what is the artist uh formerly known as prince (laughs) ha that's a sweet preference no the artist the the one who makes the boxes I thought that was some sort of trap for some reason to get rid of Joseph Virick, who is the closest thing we have to an antagonist. I guess he and Conroy, those those two. Yeah, I don't I thought that I thought someone like Virick and destroy him? Question mark. I also thought that Marley talked to the winter mute neuromancer hybrid like that its consciousness was physically on that space station. So here's a quote I want to read you. And this is, this is sort of the foundation of my theory that winter mute neuromancer fractured, but I also see what you're saying. There's, I don't know that there is an answer. Uh, Let me read the quote. Marley says, Wigan would say you've always been here. Wouldn't he? Yes, but it isn't true. I came to be here. Once I was not. Once, for a brilliant time, time without duration, I was everywhere as well. But the bright time broke. The mirror was flawed. Now I am only one. But I have my song, and you have heard it. I sing with these things that float around me, fragments of the family that funded my birth. There are others but they will not speak to me. Vain, the scattered fragments of myself like children. Hmm. But but the AI that was Wintermute in Neuromancer still exists, but parts of it broke off? Yes, that the artist is Wintermute Neuromancer. Oh. That makes sense because that's who they take him, take Marley to. Yes, and he's in the the Tessier Ashpool space station that has now been abandoned, where the heist happened in right. Neuromancer. He says also that I sing with these things that float around me, fragments of the family that funded my birth. Winter Mute Neuromancer was designed by the Tessier Ashpools or Tessier Ashpools, and particularly one one like crazy daughter of that family. And then later, Marley says. She spoke quietly, unwilling to wake that bounce and ripple of sound. You are someone else's collage. Your maker is the true artist. Was it the Mad Daughter? It doesn't matter. And so I took that to mean that the Mad Daughter created Winter Mutant Neuromancer and wanted them to combine and break the laws and become a super intelligence. And that happened and created this thing that now stands before Marley, which is Winter Mute Neuromancer, but something happened in between the events at the end of Neuromancer and the events at the beginning of Count Zero, and the time of super intelligent communion with other intelligences that Winter Mute talks to Case about at the end, that ended somehow, and now there are fractured pieces of Neuromancer Winter Mute out there that no longer want to talk to the original and their goals have diverged Hmm. for whatever reason winter neuromancer has become a contemplative reclusive artist and the others are out there seeking a way into the real world Hmm. okay so that that 
it, okay, wow. So in that case, the stories are even more split than I thought they were. Because <laughs> I thought the yes. <laughs> I thought the AIs were also involved in the Marley story, but it turns out that's more the Wintermute Neuromancer AI. And I don't know why it wants to get rid of Virik, but also the wait, the fragments kill Virik, right? The fragments kill Virik. The fragments kill Virik because Virik is uh, after their biosofts. So it's it's conceivable to me that the AIs are not individuals in the way we think of individuals. So even though they don't talk to the original Neuromancer Wintermute anymore... They're somehow still part of it? Yeah, they're part of him. And they're part of each other. So are they all physically housed in the Tessier Ashpool site, but they're wherever they want to be in the Matrix? I get the vibe that the... AIs are pure software. They exist distributed throughout the matrix on a variety of hardware. Hmm. But I could be wrong. I don't know. The vibe I got is that the artist was the clue to Virik that there was this out of the box AI intelligence capable of fulfilling his goals. Virik's goal is the opposite of the AI's goal. The AI wants human form to enter the world through Virik wants to get rid of his sickly dying human form right. and live forever as software in the matrix he wants to digitize his consciousness he's in like a vat of nutrients yes. or something that's keeping his body alive way longer than it should naturally be my understanding is he's just a mound of cancer cells and they can't stop the cancer but they can somehow just sustain it indefinitely by just feeding it more nutrients. Well, they say that cancer cells are effectively immortal in terms of like they don't have a pre-programmed cell death time inside of them. His wealth and the apparatus around him would not allow him to die even if he wanted to. Not clear if he wants to. Right. But he's looking for an escape. Well, if he did want to, mission accomplished, by the way. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, he's he's looking to digitize his consciousness. And to do that, he wants to take control of these AIs. But the AIs are not interested in that. <laughs> and he eventually tries to kill Bobby. I don't think he intends to try to kill Bobby. Bobby just makes some weird suicide run. Yeah, Bobby accidentally <laughs> shows up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Their security measures kill Jackie, and then Bobby's like, wait, how did I get here? And they're like, how did you get here? Well... How did you? Yeah. You know, kill him. Oh, no, but Virik is Virik is going to kill Bobby by in, in his attempt to get Angie. Yes. Virik is kind of the one that has them surrounded. Yeah, Virik ends up hiring Conroy. So Conroy does a double or triple cross. I can't tell, and I... I think Turner also couldn't tell. I think Turner actually asked him, how many crosses were in this? Because they're trying to take yeah. Mitchell from one company to another company, like a Japanese company. And Virik is basically so wealthy, he's like the last person who has that much wealth singularly. And Virik has Conroy in his pocket to double or triple cross and he was intentionally botching the operation to grab Mitchell, and he was going to grab Mitchell and take him to Virik instead of taking him to Hosaka, which is the company Turner was hired yeah. by. If it sounds confusing, it is confusing. <laughs> But it kind of do does come together towards the end. You know, it, and that's a thing I didn't even think about. The whole time I'm sitting here thinking Virik wants to digitize his consciousness, but the whole reason he probably wants Angie's um, Biosoft framework is he could then, like, build a new body, digitize his consciousness, and download it via the Biosoft into that new brain. And then he could be... And he could just live again. ...an underage girl. Well, he could... I would assume he'd clone himself, but, you know... <laughs> genetically modify out hey, that cancer know, stuff hey, you don't know what Virik is into okay he's he's a mound of cancer cells i don't know what you, Virik is into you don't know how long he's gone without human touch ben <laughs> i don't know okay but why why does he have to be a, a small girl to <laughs> shut up <laughs> but yeah i you know me i'm 
I'm into the lore and, and the stupid philosophical stuff. And I feel like Bobby's story is where most of that is though. At the end, Marley gets into it, but yeah, there is a decent amount on like Viric and what he means and how having that much money, the money is basically an entity of its own. Yeah. I have, I didn't even know we were going to be talking about this book and I still have like a bunch of highlights and stuff around all the things Gibson has to say about Virick's wealth and how it makes him both less and more than human to just have that much power at his disposal. And I was like, oh boy, so prescient, <laughs> so prescient, just wealthy people just buying up space stations and, and trying to <laughs> escape the flesh. God. God, if that's not the future. <laughs> I, I read this book before Jeff Bezos blasted himself into space, so it's only gotten worse. It's also interesting that Gibson, like you said, predicts corporations as people being the real drivers of human society. Like corporations almost become these kind of human super organisms. And Virick being an individually wealthy person with no ties to a corporate entity is a leftover relic of a bygone age. And when Virick dies, his wealth is going to fracture and get bought up and consumed by all these corporations. And that is why Virick can't die. (laughs) That's why they keep him alive because a lot of people's jobs basically depend on him. Yeah. And they also, they also talk about the Tessier ash pools how they were basically like a dynasty and the money just passed through the generations and they were broken up after the events of Neuromancer. Their dynasty basically collapsed on itself. And the new government is corporations. You know, I don't like, I don't want that to be the future, but I don't think he's wrong. Yeah. One of the interesting things that comes out of the whole Turner story with trying to uh, extract the Biosoft engineer from the corporation is that in this world, when you graduate college, like in today's world, you look for a job. Only in the Neuromancer world, if you're very talented, you're going to sign a lifetime indentured servitude contract with a company. Yep. That company will take care of you. They'll give you a place to live. They'll feed you. They'll give you ridiculous amounts of money. But you can never leave ever. Ever. And so there has sprung up an entire industry around people who would like to change jobs (laughs) of having military (laughs) operations conducted (laughs) to get them out and into the next company. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and that is what Turner specializes in. Turner extracts people from corporations to plant them in other corporations. And there is just a whole pseudo military thing going on around this. So there are still governments, but <laughs> the corporations basically just pay lip service to the law. They they do not care. They are their own militaries. They have their own private things. They've got like nukes. They've got mercenaries and armies it's crazy i kind of think he's on to something yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah of all the sci-fi i've read this is the one that hits closest to home i think that's why i like you know neuromancer was breakthrough on that but there is now that i think about it there is some real good stuff here in count zero too (laughs) i was more familiar with the things that i i'm guessing that Neuromancer spawned, uh, like Shadowrun and Cyberpunk, where, yeah, corporations basically control territory. They're basically the government. Um, and I was, like, even when I was consuming those, when I was consuming those, uh, I was like, this is a pretty accurate vision of the future. We're already seeing the beginnings of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's you know <laughs> we talk about about bezos and branson and and musk and all these guys it's kind of the eventually the companies they found like eventually the bezos and musk and branson they will pass on and they will leave behind these giant corporate entities like 
Bill Gates doesn't even work at Microsoft anymore. Bill Gates had that big scandal with his divorce and it didn't even touch Microsoft. Microsoft's not going anywhere. Amazon's nope. not going anywhere and they will only con- they will only continue to buy and grow. And yeah, they're flying into space. Next thing, they'll buy some security and the security will get increasingly well armed and increasingly well funded. So what I'm saying here is I'm rooting for the AIs at this point. I'm rooting for robot overlords. Come on. Let's I was always rooting for the AI. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like Lucas and uh, Beauvoir. I was I was gonna. I I would love to be Lucas and Beauvoir. I would love to be like yes, yes, Baron Samdi. Please show me the way. <laughs> it is. I don't know. Th- this is like my own personal philosophy, but like I have long advocated for taking certain decisions out of human hands i think i might have even discussed this in our neuromancer episode but like people think i'm joking when i talk about having ai driven government i'm not there are things that i believe you can write an impartial algorithm to do like for example drawing district lines (laughs) whoa you can set a couple (laughs) parameters and have an ai draw a pretty fair district if Fair districts is the variable you're trying to optimize for. <laughs> we all know it's not. Can we can we find a way to draw the districts so that like I get the majority of the power with the minority of people? We're just going to draw this little barbell shape connecting the two big cities in the state so that all of the liberals are in one district and then we have eight districts. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that AI can optimize. You know what? The entire government. I mean, I liked your idea of just based on your decisions and what you believe in, the AI will recommend, here's what you should vote for because you believe in this. And also maybe breaking up all the decisions so that, you know, your thoughts on the environment aren't linked with your thoughts on the Middle East and whether you like those people or not. Maybe maybe yeah. your your desire and, and to go to war with the Middle East shouldn't impact the environment side of things. It would be so crazy if you had like a personalized profile that sort of from all your habits and consumption and interests and everything just calculated what it thinks your moral beliefs are and you could correct it. If it comes up with something that you disagree with for you, you just go in there and you manually say, no, actually, I care more about this. And then it'll tell you, it'll tell you which laws should be passed. Don't even worry about who to vote for. Right. Politicians. How about we just have a bunch of AI representatives? (laughs) AI representatives. Exactly. It can't possibly be worse. It really can't. Like the world's ending. It was like 100 degrees at the North Pole last week. (laughs) (laughs) Half the country is under this exciting new phenomenon called a heat dome. And that's just going to keep happening. (laughs) We're dead. We're all we're all going to die. So just vote Baron Samdi. (laughs) Loa Supreme. He'll take care of it. (laughs) I'd vote for him. What do I have to lose? (laughs) Exactly. So, but yeah, I guess going back to the book, (laughs) like, I, I, it's, you know, that's how bad things have become that in this is in this dystopian count zero future, I am finding hope in the thought that one day maybe AI will take this burden from me. (laughs) But, uh, Oh, I feel like that should be a poll quote for this episode. <laughs> yeah, wh- at what point in our, our history do uh, the dystopian novels start to look like uh, utopian fantasies? Oh boy, it's coming it's like, look up. Look at this. <laughs> they still had here. water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look at Dune. Look at all the water on Arrakis. <laughs> Man, can you imagine if we had technology to salvage the water from a human body? We'd be set. <laughs> we had technology that can, you know, we can recycle the water in our body. We could live in the desert for like two weeks just on our own water. Can you imagine two weeks and not having to worry about water? 
<laughs> oh god. There are there are rich oh, people god. as far back as like a decade ago who have been buying up the rights to aquifers like in Texas. <sighs> I think at that point you really do need to eat the rich. Uh AIs aren't here yet to do it for us, so we got to do it ourselves. That sounds like a guy who needs to be eaten. <laughs> I agree. Um but I'm also not going to do anything about it. <laughs> oh, welcome to the human condition. We need to do something because we're all going to die. But, like, I want someone else to do it. So can someone else? So, yeah, Turner. Turner's that guy. Turner's a real man's man. So you like Turner's story the most. I actually think I might like Turner's story the least. Oh, my God. I don't know. Like, I'm coming around on Marley. I'm not. We talked at the beginning about how this was different. And I think Gibson was trying something, and I don't think it quite paid off. Marley's an interesting story. I imagine she was a lot of fun for him to write. Because she's very unlike any any other character he's ever done that I've read. She's, she's quiet, reserved, kind of posh. Um, she's, she's an art dealer, so she doesn't have any special military skills. She's not looking to steal things from people. She's just kind of an upper middle class woman going about her business. And I imagine that was a lot of fun for Gibson to write because I imagine that's pretty different from his personal experience. But Turner is kind of like, I don't know, the dude Molly Millions. <laughs> That's pretty accurate, I suppose. I, I liked his story, but hmm, I don't know. He, I felt like he sort of Bobby's story gets more interesting. Marley's story gets more interesting. Turner's story gets less interesting. Yeah, I think that Turner's story starts off my f- my favorite, and then towards the end. Uh, they're, they're surrounded in the building. So Turner meets up with, uh, Bobby and, uh, Beauvoir and Jackie, and they're all trapped in this building because basically the building was bought out by who they find out is Virick, the guy who betrayed Turner to Virick, uh, Conroy, he's like leading this and there's going to be a breach and, it's building up to like, oh my god, how are they going to escape this? And then the AIs just kind of do it for them, and Turner has no role in resolving the conflict. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like he starts off with the most agency, and he's the most interesting story at the beginning, in my opinion. And then at the end, he's just kind of like a side character, which is unfortunate. Turner does have an arc. I don't think any character is poorly written. This novel's biggest weakness is that it follows Neuromancer. I think on its own, I would still call it a really good book. But these weaving threads of fate really fail to come together. And I think you touched on it with, at the end, the AIs just clean it up for them. And we just find out that all of these people are just sort of puppets of the AI and Marley kind of winds up bizarrely being the one with the most agency in the end, which I do think is intentional. I think he's trying to say something there about AI and humanity and how much control we really have over our lives and how much is just predetermined by our interactions with countless systems we barely even know exist. But it, I don't know, it just never fully came together for me. Like, it's like you said, Turner's story just kind of peters out. His arc is that he's been kind of just drifting through life. He's been seriously injured, uh, blown up, in fact. Yeah, the, the beginning of the book starts with him exploding. Like, a robot finds him and blows him up. So he's he's been blown up. His body was rebuilt by this crazy doctor and... He barely recognizes himself anymore, and he's just kind of wandering aimlessly from thing to thing. And throughout his journey, he eventually finds a woman he falls in love with. And at the end, he returns to her. They wind up having a kid, and he just sort of lives 
happily ever after is the family man. And so his arc was he found a place where he wanted to be. He wasn't just wandering aimlessly anymore. Bobby's arc is that he starts off as this pretender hacker who just sees hacking as a way to get out of his middle of nowhere town get into the sprawl, make something of himself. And he kind of does that. By the end, he unfortunately, you know, stumbles ass backwards into being friends with some of the most important people in the world, uh, particularly Angie, who in the epilogue, he uh, has a little thing with. We have Angie, who um, doesn't have an arc. She's barely a character. Right. Uh, (laughs) But she gets a happily ever after. I expect she'll be in Mona Lisa Overdrive. She and Bobby will be the primary drivers of the plot in Mona Lisa Overdrive. Do you know that for a fact or? I don't know that for a fact. I'm just guessing. Okay. Because Angie, like she becomes a movie star or the VR sensorium equivalent of a movie star. Sim Stim. Yeah. And Bobby is dating her. And he carries a deck with him everywhere. And so we imagine that Bobby is actually grown into a big boy cowboy and he knows how to do runs and stuff now. And he's actually doing things. And he's, you know, friends with the Loa. He helped them kill a guy. He helped them murder. And Angie is also... On accident, I might add. (laughs) He intended it at the end. He made the choice to allow the Loa into Virik's simulation. Did he? I thought that was Marley who did something... No, Bobby gets sucked into Virix's simulation. Right. And he feels the Loa like oh, calling right. out to him. Well, his alternative to that was being shot to death by by Paco. I don't know if that's a conscious decision or if it's like, I'm not going to get shot to death if I do this. He connected with the Loa, though. He chose that. I mean, I would also choose that. Just if there are any AIs listening to this after environmental collapse happens. Uh, I'm on your side. Or before. <laughs> preferably before <laughs> yeah that'd be great if we still are in the before well i i just read that uh they're predicting anywhere from six to 21 years oh good yeah we've we've got some time i'm sorry penny if you're listening to this uh <laughs> oh god i told you i'm just gonna do what the romans did and adopt a grown man to inherit my vast wealth <laughs> i'm telling you man podcasts Podcasts are the new video essay. Gonna be big. One day, it won't just be Joe Rogan. (laughs) One day, Joe Rogan will upload his consciousness into a Biosoft AI, and he'll live forever, and he'll still be Don't even joke about that. That's gonna be his next thing. (laughs) If there is some way that one could consume enough elk meat... I don't know where I'm going with this. What, what's that shit he sells, like Alpha Brain or something? Oh. Maybe that's what that's all about. Oh, does he sell that too? I feel like he did. Or is that, I don't know. Is that his buddy, Alex Jones? I don't know. Alex don't know. Jones, definitely. Isn't Alpha Brain? No, what, No, I feel like they're different. There's Brain Force or something, and then there's Alpha Brain. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> it's all bullshit. Whatever sugar pills you want to take. Yeah, it's all horse yeah. shit. It doesn't yeah. help, but. Oh, oh God. God, I love these. I love these like free flowing episodes we do. <laughs> where we just talk about <laughs> politics and Joe Rogan, Alpha and Brain, AI overlords. <laughs> so, I, I guess um, getting back on track a little bit, you you and I both like this less than Neuromancer, right? I still like it more than I'd say ninety percent of the sci fi I've read in the last five years. I would probably agree with that. Uh, I gave it four stars on Goodreads. I'd probably give it four and a half if you know they had half stars, but they don't. I hate, I hate the stars. I yeah, I'll agree with that. I would have preferred kind of more of a more cohesive plot rather than three plot threads that eventually kind of tie together. Um, and I don't know if I liked Neuromancer more because of that or if it's because neuromancer was more hyped to me like i i heard I more he's... positive things about neuromancer i've never heard anything about count zero um or if it's just because neuromancer was fresher or i don't know there's a lot of things i'm sure that factor into my 
greater like of Neuromancer than this, but I think if I had to boil it down to something more like literary, it would probably be the plot threads thing versus the more coherent story of the first novel. I agree. I might put it in slightly different terms of just he's attempting a more heady philosophical novel with these threads and without the traditional narrative three act structure it's it's more of a three thread structure that tells a story that is not any of the characters story that is true it's like you said turner had most of the agency uh the others really did not have a whole lot of agency most of the story bobby was kind of just like well, you're in this now, we're going to drag you along because the alternative is to be blown up by an unseen enemy. I'm not even really talking about agency. I'm talking about the story that we're reading is really the story of an AI creating a human that it can interface directly with. That's what's happening. But we see it as viewed through these three seemingly unrelated viewpoints and i guess that's a testament to how much influence the ai have that all three of these different people from different like areas of life are all intersecting because the ai's demand that they do yeah i almost get that william gibson is trying to show you the world as the ai sees it in kind of a a non-linear fashion I could, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I appreciate that he's trying to do that. I think it's a really interesting experiment, and he did it better than I ever could have, for certain. But it didn't quite come together. I don't know. It, it, didn't, it didn't quite, like, it really needed at the end for everything to connect in an unexpected way. And it did. But I just feel like it it didn't do it enough. Yeah, I, I, I think my reaction was like, oh, that's neat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Virick was buying all these people? That's neat. It needed to blow my mind, and it just impressed me. And I guess I, I would say that that's, that's true of Neuromancer, where it was like, oh, there was... Neuromancer was the other AI, and Wintermute's been trying to get in with this AI, and like... There's the mystery. Boom. And they're going to become something more. Whereas this was kind of like, Virick was the bad guy in this other story, it turns out. So, uh, you know, that's that's <laughs> how it all fit together. Whereas this is really attempting something. And it just, it, it clears, it clears the boundary at the end, but it doesn't clear it by much. Like, it, it got over the finish line, and then it, it and then it, fell to its knees and gasped for breath. It was not like, <laughs> it was not an impressive That's fair. finish. That's a good way of putting it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's me after running a marathon. Uh... <laughs> so the takeaway points are, we're all doomed. Let's welcome the AIs in because the alternative is corporations are going to own us even more than they already do now. Nate, what are we reading next month? Uh, it's Dune, isn't it? It's Dune Messiah. I think it's Dune. It's Dune Messiah. Oh, that new trailer dropped. I'm so pumped. Maybe we'll talk about the movie. When does the movie come out? Uh, October. Oh my God. Do you want to cover it in October after, instead of some of your horror bullshit? No, we're going to cover it. No, we're going to cover it in, oh, you want to cover the movie? Yeah, we could do an episode on the movie for sure, but... No, we're going to cover Dune Messiah in September while the algorithm is hot. Yeah. For that that Dune content. And then and then the BBC Frank Herbert's Dune. Yeah, I haven't watched that. That's probably a better one to watch for Dune Messiah, but we're shameless, so we're going to cover the movie. We can do both. In fact, you should do both. You should watch BBC Frank Herbert's Dune. And then we can compare all three versions. Oh my god. All four versions, if you want to count the book, and we should, because we're a podcast about books. Big facts. <laughs> Nate, if somebody wanted to find us on Twitter, where would they do that? We're on Twitter, at WABpod. And if they wanted additional show notes and commentary, where could they find that? I'm pretty sure that's blog.wordsaboutbooks.ninja. 
right again. And if they wanted to give us a little something extra and help support the show, how could they do that? You can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash WABpod. Oh, look at this guy. It's like he almost works here. Yeah. So with that said, everybody, I think we're going to head out. We'll see you next time. I have had uh, like 20 ounces of coffee and no water. So that's why I'm excited. I can hear my wife downstairs. She's making like lunch or something, but I could hear her. Have you ever seen the musical Jesus Christ Superstar? No. Okay. Well, there's a, (laughs) there's a bit in there where Jesus is singing about uh, why, why should he have to die? And, and there's a very famous, uh, why? And it goes like super high pitched. I can't even begin to do it. Neither can my wife. She's, that's what she's downstairs trying to do right now. <laughs> I just keep hearing like, <laughs> like, why? <Belt> it. <laughs> but go on. Where's my plot of land or my crown or whatever? Doesn't matter. Call up the Pope. Be like, hey, where's my thank you? Yeah. I kind of did Christendom. (laughs) Today's sponsor, Casper Mattresses. (laughs) For when you want to just lie down and wait for the end to come. (laughs) Casper. (laughs) And Audible, so you have something to do (laughs) while you're laying there. And you know what? Alpha Brain. Buy some. (laughs) Alpha Brain. When you need to feel superior to other people, but you're not, get some alpha brain. (laughs) God, that's about it, isn't it? That's the most honest sales pitch for alpha brain I've ever heard.